For many years, John the Baptist helped prepare the way for Jesus through his teaching and preaching. When the time came for Jesus to begin his ministry, he was baptized by John in the river. Hear now this story from Mark 1. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love. In you I find happiness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Earlier this week, my middle son asked me, Mom, tell me again how you named me. I'm named after a king, right? Tell me again, Mom. As you can guess from his question, it's one that he's asked before, a story that he's beginning to know very well. We've told him that his name, Josiah, comes from a young king in scripture who took the throne at eight years old and led his people to to follow God. Our other boys quickly chime in, and they want to know the stories of their names, too. And of course, I love telling them, because we spent months and months praying and discerning and deciding exactly what their names would be. And we chose names that carried with them our prayers and our hopes for our children. Among my most cherished memories includes the moment of their birthdays when we finally spoke out loud and revealed to them and to the world their names. It was a holy moment then to name our children, to speak this word declaring who and whose they were And I think it's a holy moment still when they ask me about their names, especially because what I hear in their question is them really asking, who am I? Where do I belong? What is my story? And I think, man, don't we all want to figure that out? Don't we all long to belong? We have this strong desire deep within our core to be known and to belong to one another. It's why we find ourselves grounded in knowing the stories of our ancestor. Roots find themselves buried deep within us and give us sure footing as we grow. And some of us have struggled because we don't know that story. Perhaps because... There isn't anyone around any longer to share it with us that the storytellers and rememberers have no longer, are no longer here. 
or perhaps we are trying to break apart from unhealthy systems of generations past and are trying to tell a new story and blaze a new way. All of us in our lives have a unique story to tell that likely includes both joys and heartaches, hopes and broken dreams, but shared among us is this desire to be known and to belong. Throughout Advent, we heard the origin story of John the Baptist and how he came to be. And then on Christmas, we heard the story of the birth of Jesus, our Messiah, And now today, as you heard in our scripture reading, their paths cross. Some 30 years have passed since that first Christmas in Bethlehem. And now Jesus is a grown man, and he's on the verge of beginning his public ministry. But first, as we heard, Jesus pauses to remember his own story of belonging, to hear again who and whose he is. This story, the baptism of Jesus, is told in each of the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are what we call the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke because their stories are so similar. They share a common view and they tell many overlapping stories. Even though they have different audiences and different perspectives, there's a great deal of overlap as they tell us the story of Jesus from his birth through his ministry until his death and resurrection. Now, in all three of these synoptic gospels, Jesus begins his ministry with baptism. In Mark's gospel, it sounds like this. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for the people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. We hear in these verses that crowds of people are flocking to the river. All the people of Jerusalem, we're told, or at least it felt that way, were coming to the river to be baptized by John. The sun beat warmly down upon them, and John stood in the middle of the river preaching and baptizing, inviting people to have their lives and their hearts changed. One after another, people came, men and women, young and old, widows and children, fishermen and shepherds. They felt that longing within them to be known and to be claimed by God and to watch as their worries and fears, their sin and their brokenness could be carried away, washed down the river. I wonder if John's arms were beginning to be tired from baptizing so many people. I wonder if his voice was cracking or stretched thin as he tried to make clear to these crowds the word of God that he was sharing. I wonder if John was ever ready for a break. Maybe he needed lunch. But then all of a sudden in line was John's cousin, Jesus. Can you imagine this? The Son of God waiting in line to be baptized. The one who will free us from our sins and our brokenness. The one who restores our hope and gives us life. This one, the Holy One, waits to be baptized. As the Gospel of Matthew tells us, John tries to argue with Jesus and says, Oh no, you do not need to be baptized. You do not need to be baptized by me. But like any of us who have tried to argue with Jesus, we know already how it ends. John lost, right? Because Jesus, who is God in flesh, here to live among us, to experience all of human life, Jesus would be baptized, and no one, not even his cousin John, was going to stand in his way. The Gospel of Mark picks up again and tells us this about Jesus' baptism. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down upon him. And there was a voice from heaven, you are my son, whom I dearly love, in you I find happiness. 
the heavens split open. The Holy Spirit descends and God speaks. This sounds familiar to me. In the beginning, God spoke, and the heavens and the earth were created. The water, the land, the whole earth was made by God's voice. In the beginning, God spoke, and every living creature was given life. And God called them, and God called you, good, very good. Now on this day, a new creation is birthed. Jesus, the Christ, comes from the water. God spoke, and the heavens are opened. God spoke, and the Spirit descends. God spoke, and Jesus is named. You are my Son, whom I dearly love. In you, I find happiness. This story takes my breath away. It's such a beautiful and incredible statement of belonging and love. I remember the day that I held each of my children and spoke their names out loud. You are mine, I said, whom I dearly love. And I knew then that there was nothing that my little ones could do, ever do, that would change the immense love that I felt for them. And then they entered their toddler years, and some days they challenged that thinking, but eventually they'll grow to become teenagers and young adults, and I hear that's even more challenging as they make decisions of their own. But no matter what, I'll turn to them and say, you are mine, whom I dearly love. In you, I find happiness. And on this day, as Jesus is baptized, God models and defines for us this kind of love that is for all of us. Now remember, Jesus has done nothing yet in way of his public ministry. In Mark's gospel, this is the story that introduces us to Jesus. We're in the first chapter of Mark, maybe like four, seven verses in. And so right away, before Jesus has even begun his work, God is already declaring that he loves and finds happiness and delight in Jesus. And you'll notice what God does not say. The heavens did not split open and the spirit descends and then God says, this is my son who performs great miracles, who never misses a Sabbath, who gives really great sermons, who uh, whatever else follows. Jesus God doesn't say any of those things because Jesus' biography is blank thus far aside from being born, and yet Jesus is called God's beloved. Jesus is the one who gives God happiness. And you know what? God feels the same way about you. You are God's beloved child whom God dearly loves. In you, God finds happiness. On that day, when you were baptized, whether you were an infant or a teen or an adult, whether you remember it or not, this account of Jesus' baptism was repeated for you. The heavens opened, the Spirit descended, and God spoke your name. Beloved. This isn't contingent on how religious you are or how good you are. It doesn't matter if you can recite one verse of scripture or or thousands or even none at all. God finds happiness and delight in you because you are God's child. You have been marked by God's grace and healed by God's love. And just like the first people who were gathered in the river and baptized by John, your brokenness is carried away down the river too. And you are wrapped in Christ's eternal love. Now, maybe some of you here today have never been baptized, and you're wondering what this might mean for you. Here are a couple things for me. First, we have water. There is nothing to prevent you from being baptized. So after worship, find me or find Pastor Tammy and let's chat. And two, and this is most important, you are already God's beloved. You are already part of God's family and loved deeply by God, covered in God's grace. You already bring God great amounts of happiness. Okay.
Now today, as we, as we know, is the last day of 2023. And with it, I'm guessing many of us are taking time to reflect on the last year. Maybe you've asked yourselves things like, what was a favorite memory or experience from the year? What did we accomplish and do well? How did I fail but still showed courage? How did we just fail and fall flat? And many of us will set resolutions and goals for the year ahead. According to Forbes, the most common New Year's resolutions, you can probably guess what these are, uh, it's about improving your health or fitness, improving your finances, and improving your mental health. The next three most common ones are about traveling more, improving your, um, your performance at work, and meditating or increasing your, your faith in some way. Now, I'm going to set goals for this coming year, too. Later today, my family will gather, and we will set some goals about how we will spend our time together this year and something we want to learn. Luke and I will find time to set intentions about how we will grow and strengthen our marriage and our faith. And I always set a goal for reading. It's my favorite thing to do. I tell you all of this just so you know that I'm a fan of making intentions and setting goals for the year. But I want to offer you a suggestion as you do. Instead of starting this year by setting goals only around improving yourself, as if you are already beginning the year in a deficit, maybe instead start by remembering who you already are, that you are a beloved child of God, that you are someone that God finds happiness and delight in. There is nothing you can do. There is no resolution or goal you can set that will change this. You are already God's joy and God's delight. And so what if instead we started this next year by making a renewed covenant with God, helping us believe and trust that we are God's, that we are loved, that we are good, And how about we start in that place? How might you grow in love of God this year? How might you love more deeply your neighbor this year? How might you claim more fully the delight God already finds in you? Now, I don't think God cares very much about goals of self-improvement for self-improvement's sake. But I think God cares very much about how we love and who we love I think God cares very much about how we live as ones who have been marked by God. How do our words and actions, our movements, reveal God's grace in the world? Do you love those that God loves? Do you comfort the grieving, befriend the lonely, welcome the outcast, help those in need? After Jesus is baptized, in each of the synoptic gospels, he quickly moves into public ministry. He's first tempted by the devil and then moves on to preach, to call disciples, to teach people about God's love, to heal people. And Jesus does all of this, not because of some goal to improve himself, not because he's trying to earn God's love. He does this because Jesus is sharing God's love that is already fully him. He's sharing God's love and and looking to expand and to build up the kingdom of God already among him. Being confident in who he is, Christ then can go into the world. How might we covenant to do the same? Across the Wesleyan tradition and throughout United Methodist churches around the world, we have a tradition of beginning each year by renewing our covenant with God It's a way that we practice trusting that we are God's and asking God to guide us in the year to come. John Wesley encouraged Methodists to pray this covenant prayer at the start of each year as a way of renewing and remembering our baptisms, of hearing again God's claim on our lives. This week, our bishop, Bishop Lynette Plombeck, shared a few words around this covenant prayer, and I wanted to share some of them with you. She said this, The covenant prayer helps us remember what this Jesus way of life looks like 
in what loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as God loves us looks like. When we pray this prayer, we remember that we are baptized, and we remember those baptismal promises. We renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they find themselves. We confess Jesus Christ as our Savior and put our full trust in his grace. We promise to serve Christ as Lord in union with the church. These are our baptismal promises. We renew our promise to live as faithful members of Christ's church and to serve as his representatives in the world. And the bishop closes with this. The covenant prayer describes missional life devoted to following Jesus and serving our neighbor in the world. What does it look like for us as individuals and as a church family to begin our year by remembering that we are God's beloved and covenanting to living in such a way that we share that with others? What does it look like to recommit ourselves to those simple rules to do no harm, to do intentional good, to stay in love with God? I can't think of a better way to begin this new year than to fully trust in God's presence and grace, to commit and covenant to fully trusting that what God says about who and whose we are is true. And so I want to invite you to pray with me now this Wesley Covenant prayer. And as our faith and hope and our voices come together, let us trust that God hears us and God is with us. And God continues to claim us as God's own, saying again to you right now today, you are my child whom I love. In you I find happiness. All right. Please pray with me. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.